All right. Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, my name is Sophie Lowe, and I'm the Director of Visitor Services and Program Management at the Museum at Eldridge Street. And I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. We are so pleased and very fortunate to have Professor Annalise Hines here with us, streaming in from the West Coast to talk to us and about her new book, Mahjong, a Chinese game and the making of a modern American culture. So many of our audience members, of course, know uh, just how important Mahjong is to us at Eldridge Street. Every year for our signature egg rolls, egg creams and empanada street festival, we used to have a couple of booths for people just to play and learn uh, the different games and rules of Mahjong. Of course, this year, because of COVID, our festival is going to be virtual, which we are very sad about, but it does give us the opportunity to do something a little bit different. So um, we're really excited to announce that this year's festival, uh, we're gonna be celebrating instead of for just one day for the entire month of June. So please stay tuned, uh, uh, sign up for our mailing list to learn more and uh, receive updates about that. The museum is still closed at the moment, but we are really thrilled to be announcing our reopening on June 1st. So I hope to see many of you back there when we open. Tonight's conversation is recorded and we're also offering closed captioning, which is being powered by AI. And this means that there might be some typos in the captioning throughout. So we thank you for your patience and understanding. And you can turn this feature on by clicking on or off the CC closed captioning button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We also encourage you to ask questions throughout the program via the Q&A box also at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the program. So a little bit about our speaker tonight. Annalise Hines is an assistant professor of history at the University of Oregon. Her work has been featured on national public radio and international Chinese television. She has lived and played Mahjong in the United States and Southwestern China. And she is the author of the book that we're talking about this evening, Mahjong, A Chinese Game and the Making of Modern American Culture, published by Oxford University. So without further ado, please, Annalise, unmute yourself, turn on your video and uh, welcome. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much. I can't see anyone's faces, but I can see your names. And I really appreciate you joining us here today. Um, I have been able to give a few different um, talks related to my book. And some of you I know have seen uh, me speak another time. Rest assured that there will be some things that sound familiar, but I do try to make every event different. Um, so if you, this is your first time, please join us again somewhere else. And if you're joining us again, thank you for coming back and for being here today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And, okay. Oh, looks like it's not sharing correctly. Sorry, just a second. Let's see if I can do this one more time. Okay, it looks like it's sharing better now. Um, so there's a big question that brought us here today. How did a Chinese game shape modern American culture? Before I dive in, I want to explain for those of you who are not familiar with Mahjong, that it is a Chinese game of skill played by four people with domino-like engraved tiles, seen here. The tiles make suits that you can see here and players make specific combinations of tiles. And so the traditional game is often compared to the card game Gin Rummy. And rather unusually, Mahjong can be played as a gambling game for high stakes or, for, or as more of a parlor game for very, very low stakes. Today, a Mahjong resurgence is attracting new players, many of whom are learning a style known as American Mahjong, which is a specific variation that evolved from the original game and has become an important part of Jewish American women's culture in particular. Over the past hundred years, Americans have woven Mahjong into the uneven process of becoming a multiracial democratic society. 
illuminating how different groups experienced the possibilities, limitations, and potential costs of integration, a story that is closely linked to the story of the museum at Eldred Street and to the story of the Lower East Side. The history of how Mahjong, quote, became American is also a story of particular communities, quote, becoming American in the 20th century. One of the questions that comes up the most often when I tell people about my book is this question of how did I start this process? What brought me to this topic? Well, I came to Mahjong when I lived in China for a year before beginning my PhD program at Stanford. And here is a photo of that first game I ever played. I'm not in the photograph, I took it. Um, when a friend taught me a very basic version of the traditional Chinese game that her grandfather had taught her. And the sensory aspects really captured me when I first played the game. The way the tiles sound, the way they feel in your hands, they're cool and smooth and heavy, and the designs are really beautiful. And very interestingly, even the sets that are made by machines today, originally they were hand carved, each set still tells its own story. And as I traveled through China, I saw Mahjong everywhere and I saw how it brought people together. Here's a photo of four shop workers um, who are on break playing in the street. And this is actually uh, three women and a man. He is sensibly wearing a sun hat. American Mahjong is primarily a women's game, but Chinese Mahjong is both a men's and a women's game, and they might play it separately or together. While I was living in China, my aunt visited me and she wanted to know why her Jewish friends in Denver, Colorado played this clearly Chinese game. And that was not an obvious connection. It turned out a lot of people had asked the question, but no one had done the historical research to find out. Over the past dozen years, my research has brought me on an, numerous adventures and it's brought me to archives like the Parker Brothers room of old games right off the factory floor, to scrapbooks one of the league's founders made in the 1930s, and also to meet dozens of people who shared their personal memories with interviews with me. During the 20th century, a range of Americans engaged with this Chinese game, especially as a way to build community. My book, which is this, this is the cover design here, it unfolds in two parts, from its Chinese origins and the massive Mahjong fad of the 1920s to American Chinatowns and suburbs. The first half of the book is focused on Mahjong's history as related to consumerism, with a close examination of its economic and cultural origins in China and its ongoing evolution in the United States. Mm -hmm. The second half of the book explores how Mahjong interwove with the experiences of inclusion and exclusion in the evolving definition of what it means to be American, focusing especially on Chinese American and Jewish American histories. My talk today highlights New York's role in each of these major sta stages as an influential region during the 1920s fad years, as a home and cultural center for Chinese Americans, and as the birthplace of what becomes known as, quote, American Mahjong, led by Jewish women after World War II. So let's begin with a brief introduction to the origins of the game. Mahjong evolved as one of many male gambling games in the area around Shanghai in the mid to late 1800s, and it became part of the cosmopolitan courtesan culture, as you can see here in this print from the 1890s. It became increasingly popular among the growing number of American businessmen and expatriates who lived in Shanghai after World War I. Matrons and single women played an essential role in integrating Mahjong into expatriate social patterns and communicating the growing fad to families at home. A number of individuals, most famously a standard oil representative named Joseph Park Babcock, successfully brought Mahjong to the United States via California in 1922 and marketed it all over the country. It took off like wildfire. 
what you're seeing here is a, a huge advertisement um, produced by a store in Sacramento in California it was really typical of some of this ornate imagery um, uh, advertising the game at the time. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the types of imagery and depictions of Chinese inspired uh, imaginations and fantasies um, that uh, was really in, uh, typical of this 1920s fad. So marketers, first mostly white, soon also Chinese, imported thousands of sets, especially from Shanghai. They advertised it as an exotic, sophisticated game that com could compete with the popular card game of bridge. Soon the most elite Americans from President and First Lady Harding to Hollywood celebrities were playing it. Just two years after its introduction, Americans made Mahjong sets Shanghai's sixth largest export to the United States. Congress even added a tax law specifically targeting Mahjong sets in 1924. And that was a year that they otherwise actually reduced taxes. Americans had long followed Europe's lead in importing specific Chinese goods as markers of refinement. You can think here of China, right? What we call China, the porcelain. Um, that was really inspired by European um, consumers. But for the first time, American consumers, particularly women, led the way. As the voracious American market developed an a appetite for the game that superseded even the most ambitious uh, imagination of the marketers, in 1923, Chinese and Western merchants launched new kinds of large-scale factories in Shanghai that combined a handcrafted manufacturing process with streamlined production. And at this time, the tiles were made of bone, specifically cow bone, spliced together with bamboo. And you can see in the caption of these two craftsmen in Shanghai, uh, they are cutting the bone, um, and it says here, from USA. Chinese manufacturers of the bone and bamboo tiles actually ran out of the national Chinese supply of cow shin bones that were used to make them, so ships exporting bones from Chicago stockyards out of Texas on its way to Shanghai cross paths with those exporting Mahjong sets from Shanghai to the United States. These big steamships full of, of Mahjong sets. Chinese exporters making the bone and bamboo tiles imported so much cow bone from US stockyards that the global price of bone actually skyrocketed during this time. Now this fad started in California uh, and that was really notable in the context of its time. Um, it was notable first, as I mentioned, that this fad spread from the United States to Europe and many other parts of the world. And also that that fad was coming from the West Coast rather than these long held power centers of the East Coast, tastemakers, especially in New York. But the reality is the marketers knew that they needed, especially those New York um, advertisers, consumers, celebrities, and tastemakers to be uh, consuming this game as well. And so they launched a really effective marketing campaign that also emphasized social competition among the rich and famous. And once the rich and famous took to the game, then they generated attention for it, kind of free advertising. So this is a photograph of um, Saks on Herald Square. And this is an, uh, this uh, inset image is from an advertisement by Saks Herald, Herald Square that had a number of items all inspired by Mahjong. And you can see the title, right? It's things decidedly new when society plays at dragons and wins. And that's one of the um, kind of shorthand terms for the games. So the fad was truly across groups of class and race and also across the nation, even though uh, it became, however, associated very much as an urban game played by white socialites in Chinese costume or what they imagined was ancient royal Chinese costume. And that really, uh, so again, it was much more than that, but that becomes the primary imagery. Women like this society matron in Los Angeles, 
a Vanderbilt daughter in a Mahjong themed ballet in Manhattan, or a middle class housewife in Atlanta who read this article explaining how to host a Chinese themed luncheon, which was quote, all the rage. White women in ornate Chinese costumes experimented with exotic personae and new boundaries of respectable femininity and sexuality. The Mahjong craze hit at the same time in American culture that there was the full takeoff of mass marketing techniques, including advertising, catalogs, store displays, and Mahjong was in all of it. And here you can see um, in this richly detailed photograph from the Los Angeles department store Bullocks, you can see this sales girl actually dressed in Chinese inspired um, garb with including these side buns, which were um, uh, also a, a commonly portrayed image of Chinese women and their hairdos. So she was there to usher in customers for a newly immersive kind of shopping experience. In this case, what would have been called a quote, trip to the Orient. You can see the influence of what I talk about in the book as consumer Orientalism, which was really a mishmash of Chinese and Japanese and even Middle Eastern goods that was typical at the time as Americans and Europeans lumped quote, the East all together. The store's goal was to use this kind of experience to sell various kinds of mahjong sets, which you can see in the glass case. You can see a range of different sets. And behind her, you can also, again, see things that also just evoke this idea of, quote, the Misty Orient. From its introduction in American society, newspapers, advertisers, and popular media consistently discussed mahjong as an embodiment of authentic Chinese culture. But a lot of that discussion was based in stereotypical understandings. Most Americans really did not know much about China. Most importantly, Americans have a long history of seeing the defining feature of Chinese people as being inherently different from Westerners. Until 1952, Chinese and Japanese Americans could not become naturalized citizens no matter how long they lived in the United States or how integrated they were into their communities because of this idea of unassimilability, that they would remain perpetual foreigners. Now the 1920s, this era of the fad is remembered as a freewheeling jazz age. And in fact, it was also a deeply racist era Mahjong exploded into American consciousness at the height of immigration restrictions, nativism, and the mainstream national revival of the Ku Klux Klan. And this image should be very startling. It is uh, Klan members marching down Pennsylvania Avenue in 1925, and um, really as a demonstration of their strength. And at the time, the Klan was throughout in every state um, in the nation and was often uh, portrayed as kind of family friendly, uh, traditional values protective group. And I'm choosing this image as indicative of part of what I'm talking about rather than the many uh, cartoons of caricatured Chinese people because I actually don't want to participate in circulating those images. And this is um, also communicates, again, what was uh, a really strong part of American culture at the time. Anti-Asian racism pervaded the game's introduction to the United States, even as it became wildly popular explicitly as a Chinese game. Promoters and players alike gleefully celebrated the quote, great, exciting, hundreds of years old national Chinese game now the craze of America. So how did that happen? <laughs> In part, the game's ironic success depended upon marketers skillfully exploiting the complex and contradictory symbolism of China in American culture. Alongside negative stereotypes of unsophisticated laborers, cheap shop suey, and tradition-bound backwardness, white Americans held ancient China in high esteem as an earlier paragon of civilization. White mm -hmm. Americans imagined it themselves learning a game of Confucius and of courtly mandarins. 
they enjoyed playing with the idea of an ancient royal Chinese culture, but it was totally divorced from real contemporary people, including Chinese Americans. And this newspaper article, this illustration from this newspaper article is very typical, um, again, of this widely repeated iconography that particularly associated the game with these um, stereotyped but uh, uh, high class stereotypes of um, ancient mandarins and often explicitly linking it to Confucius who had nothing to do with the game. Mahjong was in fact a modern game, less than a century old, but advertisers created an air of exoticism to create excitement while distancing the game from Chinese American contemporaries. And it worked. White Americans embraced a Chinese game while still rejecting Chinese people. Chinese Americans, meanwhile, leveraged Amer Mahjong's popularity for economic opportunities, like these Chinese American Mahjong instructors in LA in a highly discriminatory economy, in a context in which they, regardless of American birth, English fluency, American university degrees in a wide range of fields, it was very difficult to get um, any well-paying jobs, and especially jobs outside of these um, uh, stereotyped economic sectors like laundries, restaurant work, and curio shops. So for a short period of time, Mahjong instructor, instruction actually provided a real economic opportunity, even as it was also intertwined with stereotypical ideas of Chinese people. Chinese Americans also uh, leveraged the fad and the game for cultural authority to the broader public. And here is this image of a USC college student, um, Eleanor Chan, who spoke against Joseph Bob Babcock. You might remember him. I mentioned him early on as a really important importer and influential marketer of the game. Well, in the midst of this massive competition with other marketers, Babcock tries to control his uh, authority over the market by saying, actually, it's not a Chinese game. I made the whole thing up. And this really sparks out outcry um, by Chinese Americans who say, you cannot claim this game. This is a Chinese game. And for a young Chinese American woman to be featured, photographed, named by her real name, not some kind of um, stereotype name, which often happened, uh, as speaking against uh, this very established wealthy white businessman, that's significant. Um, and so you can see this complex relationship to this fad as linked to explicitly, again, a Chinese game. Beginning in the 1920s in Chinatowns across the United States, the rumble of shuffling mahjong tiles could be heard in apartments, association halls, and the back rooms of general stores as the game became a fixture in Chinese American communities. Mahjong's cultural meaning emerged in the context of the global 1920s fad. By the 1930s, Mahjong stood in both China and abroad as the quote, national game of China. Over the following decade, Mahjong became embedded in a built landscape of Chinatown spaces that served dual purposes, facing outward to white consumers and facing inward to Chinese Americans. In the process, the game became established in the tension between inclusion and exclusion that would define the experience of Chinese American ethnicity in the early 20th century. Chinatown residents participated in commodifying and marketing Mahjong as an aspect of Chinese culture for outsiders. And this picture is from a curio shop in uh, Chicago's Chinatown. They also used it to create separate ethnic spaces for Chinese Americans to engage with each other. The presence of Mahjong through the noises of the tiles and the language of gameplay, through its visual presence in public spaces and in private homes, that all helped mark geographic spaces of ethnic community. For Chinese Americans, playing Mahjong was not about assimilation in contrast to cultural continuity or vice versa. Rather, it was a versatile pastime with a shared Chinese and American past that helped create spaces for a shared Chinese American experience. 
it would be easy to assume that Chinese Americans were already familiar with Mahjong by the time of the American fad, but just the opposite is true. And this is a photograph of Chinese Americans in 1920s in Portland, Oregon. In the 1920s, many Chinese Americans began playing the game along with the broader American public. It was simply not a widespread part of Chinese culture before the early 20th century. It was one of many gambling games. It was spreading in popularity, but just in specific urban centers, Shanghai, Beijing. For most Chinese Americans players at the time, it was not yet rooted in family traditions or memories of the homeland, but it represented a tie to Chinese heritage nonetheless, and it was rapidly spreading in popularity in China as well. Again, this um, enormous global fad really changes the game's meaning in China too. During the 1920s, as the quote, as the path-breaking Chinese American sociologist Party Lo noted, quote, the Mahjong craze obsessed all Chinatown. After the fat ended by the late 1920s, Chinese Americans faced different challenges in the 1930s when merchants sought to attract tourists to Chinatown during the Great Depression, including to buy things like mahjong sets. But the fad was mostly over. Iconic representations of Chinatown featured the curving pagoda roof lines, bright colors, and neon chop suey signs appealing to tourists, to outsiders. And here is an image from New York's Chinatown in, in Manhattan in the 1940s of a tour group looking at these facades. Behind and around those external facing commercial facades were private spaces for living and for a Chinese American public life. The game provided one ritual of connection, unique in its ability to cross boundaries of gender and generation into diverse spaces. And this is an image also from the early 1940s of a uh, general store in Manhattan's Chinatown. And there's no Mahjong set visible in this image, but there may very well have been one in that room that you can see behind um, or under the counter where Mahjong sets were often taken out and played with um, a variety of, of customers and community members who would come to these general stores. General stores are, are really um, key uh, members of the community that provide a lot of different services. For Chinese Americans, Mahjong also provided a sense of connection with China and a global Chinese community. As Japanese aggression worsened in the late uh, 1930s against China, Chinese Americans also used Mahjong in fundraisers for war relief. And here you can see this advertisement um, in San Francisco's Chinatown in 1938. Um, there's a benefit. And in the New York Times in 1941, um, there's this party to support United China Relief. And you can see that there is also, as we've talked about throughout, this complicated dynamic of marketing to um, uh, a, a consumer orientalism of Chinese culture but for and by Chinese uh, uh, and Chinese Americans to, to support war relief in China. The game's tiles created a particularly resonant sense of a Chinese cultural space. When players shuffled the tiles, the clattering rumble could echo down alleyways. Walking down along Chinatown sidewalks, one observer noted, a visitor could hear flowing from the windows, quote, dominoes and mahjong pieces click crisply and the voluble conversation of the excited players. And this image is obviously a much more contemporary image. Um, a, a lot of what I'm talking about is historically specific. Other aspects, especially what the game has meant to people and how people interact with it, continues very much to today. My book discusses in more detail the meaning of Mahjong in the context of American policies that have long treated Asians as perpetual foreigners, including exclusion laws that targeted Chinese immigrants from the late 1800s until the military alliances of World War II and wartime policies that forcibly removed Japanese Americans from their homes in the wet, on the West Coast. And most of them were American by birth and it confined them in incarceration camps. 
Mahjong was a part of each of these stories and it reveals important aspects of Asian American history. And I'm happy to answer um, more in any Q and A. Um, but just as a quick side note, um, the history of Asians and Asian Americans in New York and the growth of places like Flushing as a Chinese American center, that all happens um, at, as part of a dramatic changes in the late 20th century from immigration laws that move away from national exclusions towards privileging things like um, education, certain economic sectors, and family reuni reunification. So the uh, story of Asian Americans and Mahjong changes a lot in the late 20th century and early 20th, 21st century. The history I focus on in the book and today mostly predates um, those uh, changes in policies. So back to the 1930s, along with Chinese Americans, other pockets of players remained after those fad years of the 1920s. From these seeds emerged new and uniquely American variants of the game. The most influential adaptation by far was driven by the National Mahjong League. And this is a picture from the 1960s of the president and board of the league. After World War II, Mahjong became embedded in middle-class Jewish American neighborhoods across the country. New York is at the center of this story. In the late 1930s, a group of Jewish women in New York established the league to revitalize what they believed was a wrongfully neglected game. And they gathered here this, you can see from this newspaper headline, 200 women were expected um, to standardize the game. Twice that number showed up, 400 women showed up and they gathered at Essex House um, right off of Central Park, this um, beautiful Art Deco luxurious hotel that um, the soon to be president of the league, Cecil, um, Viola Cecil was living in at the time. One of the founders of the league, Dorothy Meyerson, was especially important in developing and spreading the game. She was very media savvy. She appeared on radio and even very early television to teach people the game. Uh, so the nation's first uh, experimental te television programming was in New York City, it was in the early 1940s. She is on it, she stays on television. This image is from 1951. Um, and uh, you can see she is uh, uh, introducing the game, teaching people in those very early um, television shows where the resolution was so um, pixelated, she also created these especially enlarged Mahjong um, tiles so that uh, images rather so that she could show people what the tiles, what the images on the tiles look like. The League's game is what is popularly known today as quote, American Mahjong. In contrast to the version imported from China years earlier that was similar to Gin Rummy, the league created a smaller number of acceptable winning hands with more variations in combinations. Importantly, the National Mahjong League eventually sold this annual rule card of acceptable hands, and that becomes a defining and unique feature of the league's style of, of playing the game. And you can even see it in this image from 1951. If you look at the table, the edge of the table in front of Dorothy Meyerson, you can see um, the, the folding out card of acceptable hands. And I'll show you uh, uh, another couple images as well. So here you can see in this set, um, a card from 1963, 1964, and it's a trifold. Um, any, any players of American Mahjong, this is old hat to you, but for people who play other forms of Mahjong who don't play any of forms of the game, um, this is often a kind of surprising uh, surprising news that people play with a card. The desire to standardize the game with a shared set of rules quickly became a business idea. The hands changed every year, so every year required buying a new card. And this again is totally unique to um, the uh, league's form of the game. And because at the time, these were generally uh, members of the board were women of means, financial means, who not only did not need to work for financial necessity, it would have actually 
hurt their and their family social stature to have these women working for wages. So they volunteered their labor, but they were selling these cards. And after um, it was growing in popularity, and so after it covered their expenses, they had these funds. And what they began to do was actually use it as a fundraising tool. And so they began donating a portion of their proceeds to specific charities. And that becomes a really important way that the league markets itself and, and also spreads. The league's fundraising starts locally. In fact, uh, Dorothy Meyerson first sold her Mahjong book as a fundraiser for her synagogue in the Forest Hills neighborhood uh, in Queens. Um, but after the United States entered World War II in 1942, the league continued to promote the game as a patriotic tool. And you can see that in their newsletter advertised here on the front page. In 1941, for example, this is be, uh, even before Pearl Harbor, but as uh, the um, war is spreading around the world, the National Mahjong League convention theme was, quote, the vital part which Mahjong can play in giving women a greater role in democracy. And they also, here in Manhattan, they use the funds to buy a mobile canteen that would um, provide refreshments and relief to service members stationed around the um, uh, island of Manhattan at the time. So wartime also helped change Americans' attitude toward China as a wartime ally. And that was an idea that Chinese Americans also worked hard to promote in this context. Another wartime expansion, which I won't develop today, but again, happy to accept um, questions and talk more about it, uh, but it took place within military culture. During the war, some members of, of the military and especially Air Force officers' wives began playing the 1920s style game again. And they, uh, these Air Force officers' wives eventually developed their own, also uniquely American version of the game. And it becomes named after the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And their version continues to be played on Air Force bases around the world. This image is from the 1960s, um, but again, they really began in the 1940s and does continue to today. Dorothy Meyerson continued her own Mahjong business that she had started before the league began. Um, and so she actually sold sets to Wright Pat players, um, these uh, Air Force officers' wives players. She sold the sets and those sets were made by New York manufacturers. So the development of these specifically American versions of the game were tied up with the relocation of Mahjong manufacturing for the American market that landed almost entirely in New York. By the 1960s, the league had changed the game repeatedly. It had tweaked it over those um, in, uh, first several years of existence. And they had transformed the game enough that it required additional tiles and different rules. And so um, when the league codified its style of play first in the 1930s, and again, um, through these periods of experimentation, solidifying in the 1960s, it marked the cultural and physical Americanization of the game. Overall, however, the tiles shared the same increasingly standardized Chinese originated designs that kept it a recognizable form of Mahjong. The changes to the game that the league initiated were enabled by their close proximity to the small factories making the tiles. The locus of Mahjong manufacturing moved from China to plastic fabricating shops in New York City after the Japanese invasion of China in the late 1930s and um, the war. And those factories emerged also alongside the league's growing popularity with their version of the game. These were factories that were making other games or other small fabricated items and Mahjong becomes a new market for them. So those tiles move from bone and bamboo to plastic like the ones you can see here. Now, although these are plastic tiles, they're not simply machine made, it's still hand fabricated. This, these images 
um, are what is left of the painting, um, the painted signs of the Marvelette Corporation, which is in Queens. You can see at the bottom, it says Mar the Marvelette Corporation. At the top, if you kind of squint your eyes, you can see how the painted brick reads plastics. Um, they actually were um, using chemicals to create these new kinds of plastic that were rapidly emerging in the 20th century, but then they sold then those forms of um, hardened plastic and rods and in other shapes to the fabricators then that would shape them into mahjong tiles. In the book, I follow two factories, both of them family run, one named Empire Games, and this is a, the image of the um, husband and wife who were um, involved in this tiny little factory. I took this picture when I interviewed them. Um, and this factory was in a loft on Canal Street at the edge of Chinatown, actually just west of the Elder Street Museum. Um, and I also follow then another factory that becomes one of the most prolific manufacturers. Empire Games with Edith and Seymour Silverman, who you're seeing here, remains really small and short-lived. Um, but A&L, which is run by an Italian family in Brooklyn, becomes very successful. And um, uh, if you have a set or if you've seen a set with the Royal brand, you have an A&L set. National Mahjong, um, which is the league's game, again, what's known as American Mahjong today, you might have picked up already. I generally don't call it American Mahjong because there are multiple uniquely American forms of the game. I call it National Mahjong, which is what the league called it. But that becomes uh, a part of especially middle-class Jewish American culture during the post-war year. That's really when we see it grow and um, uh, become such an iconic, iconic part of Jewish American culture. So why does that happen? Well, the league, what we just talked about is a crucial part of that answer. And New York is too. And the way that New York is also integrated into the history of Jewish Americans. As we know, the league begins in New York. The factories making their sets are in New York. And the residential and vacationing rhythms that make the game appealing and sometimes even really socially important and necessary that make it spread, those are all rooted in New York. But many of those factors then also become a national story. So although New York is central to this history, many of what, much of what I'm about to talk about has um, national uh, ramifications. A couple of hours north of New York City, the Catskills became an important place for Jewish families to retreat to during the sweltering summers. In these vacationing communities, not only, but especially influentially in the Catskills, women ran seasonal households amidst reduced domestic obligations. In one slice of life in the Catskills, mothers and children would stay all summer in little cottages called bungalow colonies while husbands would go back and forth for the weekends. Even some working women would leave their jobs to stay in the mountains during the summers. These really became unique landscapes of what I call leisure domest domesticity. And Mahjong was central to life there. In the bungalows, domestic work continued, but it was much lessened as children went to day camp and expectations for meals and cleaning were lowered. As one woman who went to the Catskills as a girl told me, women played mahjong, quote, all the time, really all the time. Except, however, when the husbands returned, quote, when the men were there, they were there for their men. And that would be an important distinction from how mahjong functioned in the home. In the Catskills or in other vacationing communities like it, women could socialize without making demands on their husbands, without sacrificing their domestic duties, which in turn helped naturalize what became more of an active carving out of rare time and space inside the home when husbands and children were present, but women were temporarily not there for their men. 
Mahjong would become a key element in transferring those patterns of women's leisure into certain circumscribed times and spaces within the home. This is how and why young Jewish mothers in particular forged American Mahjong culture during the 1950s and 60s. In the midst of massive suburbanization and the baby boom and newfound upward mobility for many, regular weekly Mahjong games helped women, especially women mothers of young children, build female focused networks. Unusually, these groups focused not on volunteerism or children's education, but were instead times simply for women to have fun together. Regional patterns were different, they varied, but from Atlanta to Philadelphia and from Los Angeles to Detroit, groups across the country played the same game at parallel times and places while noshing on similar snacks. And in doing so, players created a cultural touchstone for many who grew up in post-war Jewish American homes where Jewish women relaxed together, Mahjong was very often present, both among those who traveled to the Catskills and those who did not. And here and in the previous image, um, you can also see uh, the card right in front of the racks with the tiles, that card I was referring to earlier. You can see the um, fabric on top of the tables that was um, to lessen the tiles din. This is also the sound, right, that they, they make. Um, this is all part of the material culture. Now, these vacationing communities um, that integrated Mahjong also looked like beach clubs on Long Island, community swimming pools in the Bronx and New Jersey, Jewish country clubs in Atlanta, and resorts by Lake Michigan. This group of players is playing in um, Valdosta in Georgia. And the, in the previous picture, they were playing in Philadelphia. It's important to note that Mahjong also spread among women who did not fit a middle-class, second-generation East European Jewish um, conservative congregation mold, uh, including working women and Italian Catholic women who lived in the same neighborhoods. When Catholic women played Mahjong, however, it was because they were invited into a predominantly Jewish space. They were also integrated in a remarkably consistent post-war Mahjong culture. And I've talked to so many people who remember listening to their mothers laughing and playing the game while they fell asleep and the special food that was part of hosting the ladies. And this um, image here is of a uh, um, a in a dinette in Brooklyn. Um, and you can see certain pieces of the, that culture in this image, the card, of course, but also um, if you look at this, uh, the woman's hand where she's tapping out her cigarette, um, next to her hand is a pineapple. One of the things, one of the uh, snacks that I often heard about were slices of, of pineapple with maraschino cherries speared on top, sometimes the children, even though they were shooed away during the game to give their mother space um, to hang out with their friends. They also got to do some um, fun special things in advance like putting those cherries on the pineapple. Now, not all families jumped to the more stereotypical suburban neighborhood, at least not right away. In New York City, they built upon earlier migration patterns as many moved to apartment complexes in less dense outer boroughs like Brooklyn, as you see in this image here, and the Bronx. Rita Greenstein, who this picture is also from when I interviewed her, she had moved from her childhood uh, apartment building in the Bronx to Long Island when she was experiencing part of this generational shift as she raised her children in a more suburban community in a house almost exactly like this one in Hicksville on Long Island. And this is a um, was an advertising image of that model home that then soon spread throughout that land that you see as empty in this image. After Rita raised her children um, in later life, however, she has now moved back to Manhattan. Um, and uh, again, that I think reflects part of this larger life cycle of movement and what that tells us about um, different 
uh, cultural beliefs, different opportunities, um, and choices that people make at different times in their lives. As the generations before them had successfully moved out of the Lower East Side, so their children moved to housing in nearby boroughs. And these were really stair-step migrations, um, which often began in more urban boroughs like Brooklyn, like the Bronx, and ended in suburbs on Long Island or in New Jersey. Each New York City borough and the larger neighboring regions would become major centers for Mahjong culture. So this is not only a New York story, but it is especially a New York story. And a lot of what um, I also heard when I was interviewing people were these markers of the um, landscape of New York, including consumer um, markets, because again, this, uh, this Mahjong sets were consumer goods as well. And so in this advertisement, um, I just got a kick out of showing this to people recently because it's linked to Mother's Day in 1958. You can see on a Fortunoff's uh, in Brooklyn, this is when they were in Brooklyn, um, you can see them advertising a uh, Catalan tiles. Those are the, that's the kind of plastic that the Marblet Corporation was making. Um, and you can see below, it says choice of many um, famous makes, including Low and Royal. And we just talked about right, the Royal brand, this a &L. In the midst of newly possible, but still tenuous promises of integration and upward mobility, Jewish Americans confronted the cultural risks that came with assimilation into middle-class white suburbia. And this is an image from the time, right? Commenting on how everyone is moving to the suburbs. Of course, we know that this was part of what happens with um, housing policies in the suburbs is an expansion of uh, accessibility for previously marginalized groups like Jewish Americans and Italian Americans who still faced who still faced discrimination, but were able to uh, enter these white suburban spaces, as opposed to. African Americans and depending on the region, also um, Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans. So part of what happens in these suburban spaces is a new kind of white American culture that Jewish Americans have different access to than the previous generations had. Now, to be clear, players approached Mahjong first and foremost as a game, but as it became a marker of Jewish neighborhoods and was no longer widely popular in this dominant culture, Mahjong also subtly demarcated space apart from the dominant Christian society. And this is a recent image by a Jewish artist who focuses on representations of the modern Jewish experience that he says, quote, ties us all together. So although no one stated this intention explicitly at the time, for middle-class Jewish Americans, Mahjong associated with both Chinese culture and the outmoded 1920s fad served to distinguish their evolving ethnic identity. And for women, especially mothers of young children living with the constraints of 1950s cultural expectations for women, it was often a lifeline of community. The game's adaptability created barriers as well as bridges as players pushed the evolution of distinctive Mahjong variants. Today, more than 40 variations of Mahjong exist around the world, each expressing a unique history of adaptation and each shaping specific cultures of interaction and play from Japan's competitive Ricci to graveside games in the Philippines to honor the dead on All Souls Day. In the United States, and this is a picture from Bryant Park in Midtown Manhattan, a thriving range of Mahjong styles reflects the diverse growth of Asian American communities since immigration reforms, as well as a resurgence of interest in the National Mahjong Leagues game, spreading now far beyond Jewish women's networks. Mahjong's American history is rooted in the tension between inclusion and exclusion as well as the risks of cultural erasure through appropriation or assimilation. Mahjong reveals a deeply American experience, sometimes desired and sometimes enforced, of simultaneously belonging and standing apart. 
thank you very much. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. There's some um, contact information for me as well, um, but I will stop sharing my screen now to um, so that we can have a more face-to-face -face conversation. Thank you. And Elise, thank you so, so much for, um, for that talk. I really learned so much about your, um, about Mahjong from your research. And it's so much fun to think about the different connections too between Chinese Mahjong, and I think you called it national Mahjong. Um, <laughs> when you mentioned refreshments, it's so funny. My mother who is listening in and she grew up in Taiwan, she got very excited and she messaged me and she said, yes, refreshments, they were such a big thing um, yes. even in her family. Absolutely. Uh, she said um, the refreshments were good tea and imported cigarettes. And that was a big, um, <laughs> that was like a big uh, social thing. So very, very curious. I don't think they did the pineapples with the cherries. <laughs> right, but you're, it's exactly what you're saying. Every place that has its own cultures that emerge around this game and, and food is so often a part of it. Um, yeah. Just as a quick plug, oh, I'm sorry, my cat is just visiting. Um, uh, as a quick plug, um, there's a really wonderful children's book game called, Ma or children's book um, called Mahjong All Day Long by the author Ginny Lo. And um, it's a, a, about Mahjong in a Chinese American family and her sister did the art and it includes a lot uh, about food too. But it's a really oh. wonderful book. I recommend it to anyone. That's so cute. Can you, uh, can you say what it's called again? Yes, Mahjong All Day Long okay. by Ginny, G-I-N-N-I-E, Lo, L-O. Very, very cute. <laughs> okay, well, we do have some questions that are coming in. Um, the, a couple of people actually asked, uh, what are the key differences between Chinese Mahjong and American Mahjong? And uh, the questions, the que one of the questions specifically asks, do they use a card? in Chinese Mahjong? They do not. Um, this is, you know, for people who uh, play American Mahjong, it's always so surprising when, they're, when they find out that other people don't play with cards. And same thing, when I talk to people who don't, aren't familiar with, you know, uh, American or National Mahjong, they're like, wait, people play with cards? <laughs> so that was my uh, reaction. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is a, a marker of um, the National uh, Mahjong Leagues game. And, um, so very briefly, I mean, there are more details than this in terms of the differences, um, but uh, very briefly, there are, um, the card is because there are these more um, specific winning hands that don't necessarily follow the same patterns um, and the, as the Chinese um, winning hands. And the real strategy in the Chinese game um, is rooted in this, uh, how you score. So there's very, very complicated scoring rules. Um, and that's you know where it can take, uh, although it's a simple game, it can take a lifetime to master that strategy. And um, for uh, American or national Mahjong, the strategy is much more about, again, going for those specific hands, but you make that determination much earlier in the game um, because it is a more uh, uh, limited option. And so um, although the scoring is more straightforward and it's more about how you complete those hands um, and, and kind of committing to that very early on with an additional shuffling round that also doesn't exist in the Chinese game. So there are some very fundamental differences, um, but it is a recognizable form of Mahjong. And a follow-up question on that, um, someone specifically has played um, Singaporean Mahjong where um, in Singapore, they didn't have jokers. And so oh. their question is, when did jokers uh, come into American Mahjong? Yes, um, great. Um, so jokers really emerge um, as an answer to the question that has been um, a challenging question throughout Mahjong's um, history of how much luck do you integrate or not? And um, initially uh, in, the, in the 1920s, um, by the end of that, uh, of the game's history in the bad years, flower tiles um, were just generally treated together as uh, wild cards. And so um, in the 
league's first version of the game, there's all these debates. And so the the number of flower, flower tiles actually changes over the years. And that's part of why it makes a difference to have these factories nearby, because then you can just add flower tiles. Um, and they end up with more than 20 at one point. And people decide this is way too much luck, right? We want more strategy involved. And so they go, they um, shrink the number of flowers, or now eight flowers, and they add chokers. And that happens to serve as wild cards. And that happens in the early 1960s. And that's really the last major change um, to the American game. So it stabilizes in the, in the 1960s. I see, I see. Um, someone commented that um, Mahjong went out of fashion. Uh, they said Mahjong went out of fashion during the feminist era as many women rejected the traditional role of women. How do you explain its current resurgence? I love that question. Um, so yes, one of the interesting things about the um, game, game's history and its connection to women that happens after this heyday that I talk about is that it gets very connected, um, especially again for, we're, we're now talking about specifically about um, the American or national version as connected to Jewish American women and Jewish American culture. And it gets connected to this um, stereotype of the Jewish mother that develops in the late 1960s. Philip Roth plays actually an important role, an influential role in popularizing a very, very harsh negative stereotype of the, of the Jewish mother as a very self-absorbed, domineering, dominating person. And Mahjong becomes linked to this really negative um, stereotype of, of Jewish mothers. And um, at the same time, it is connected to this um, domestic culture that I was talking about, the baby boom and the suburbia. And so I talked to um, someone who said, you know, when I was growing, when I was a teenager, the, um, the last thing I wanted to do was play Mahjong because it was basically just so expected of me, right? It was going, I was going to, I was expected to go on and um, become a wife and mother and fit in this very restrictive mold and Mahjong was my symbol for that. And um, so absolutely a lot of the next generation of Jewish women reject Mahjong sometimes quite intentionally and consciously. And it's worth pointing out that Jewish women are also um, quote, overrepresented or like, you know, that participate especially strongly in the second wave feminist movement of the 1970s. Um, and so I think what part of what happens um, to answer the, the question about right now is uh, multiple things. One is that that generation, um, they're now entering retirement and their mothers have passed away. They're in a very different life stage. And so their relationship with their mothers, which may have been very fractious when they were younger, um, more kind of actively rejecting this pattern, that has changed so that for many people, Mahjong actually becomes a really powerful way to connect with people who have passed away, especially when you're playing with your mother's set. It's a really amazing connection to get to play with the same tiles. Um, and at the same time, they're now in these communities. Um, oftentimes, right, they're relocating. It's like what, what I was talking about before in these patterns, when you see people repeatedly moving or in new communities, Mahjong is a great way to meet people. And I can talk more about why I think Mahjong is an especially powerful tool to get some of those conversations going, but it really does. It, it serves this purpose in a lot of different contexts. So now people are playing also again across some of these um, points of network and connections that had brought people to the game as part of a shared life experience. We're also seeing increased um, uh, game learning and gameplay across different life experience. So many more men are also playing. Um, people not uh, uh, Jewish Americans are, are learning the national version of the game. People are learning, people who had learned the national version now want to learn Chinese Mahjong and vice versa. So we're really seeing a diversification in multiple different ways. Um, and so I think that's a lot of what's driving it. I think there are a smaller number driving, driving it also of younger people who, especially when they're learning it for the first time, are connecting with a heritage point, either as 
Asian Americans, and there's a wide variety, right, of different national, like, you know, Philippine style, Singaporean style, Taiwanese, like you're saying, um, and also Jewish Americans. And so young men who didn't grow up with this feeling of like, this is only a women's game, more young men are also learning it um, as specifically because of a connection with Jewish heritage. So different reasons. Plus it's just a great game. People right, right. remember that. Well, I guess speaking um, speaking a little bit about how there has been a resurgence, I, I want to bring up, um, there was a spot of controversy earlier this year, and I don't know if our audience members know about this, but it was all about Mahjong, where um, a Dallas-based company released a quote, well, they, they created a new set of, of Mahjong to sell, and they said that they were, quote, respectfully refreshing um, the line of mahjong tiles and they're selling them for I think 300 to 400 dollars a pop um and there was a huge backlash uh, i think specifically from the asian uh, chinese community um about disrespecting the game and its heritage um and also about cultural appropriation and i guess you know for me as someone who is of chinese descent and grew up or, and grew up not playing mahjong but with mahjong being a, a huge part of my memories of family gatherings um i guess when you think about a, cult, a, a respectful refresh that language can be seen as disrespectful because it sounds like they might be improving or um you know making the game better in some way so listening to um this really comprehensive history of Mahjong in Shanghai to the United States to where we are today, um, it's been fully embraced and adapted and ingrained in non-Chinese households. So I, I want to hear a little bit about um, just your thoughts about why this was so controversial um, and just if you have any thoughts about, about this in general too. I do, yeah, and um, certainly this can be a longer conversation. I'm happy to answer follow-up questions. I'll try to give the short version first. Um, but uh, I think, so there were multiple things happening with this most recent um, controversy. And I definitely think it's useful and important to think through how and why um, uh, that happened. And um, so, but what I saw in the conversation around it was often two streams of, of discourse where people were not actually talking or listening to um, where, uh, you know, the other people were coming from. And I think that that is indicative of, in fact, what was at root here was about history. And it was about history that people didn't necessarily know about when they were responding one way or another. Um, and so uh, it is true that the, I think there, the, the company, um, it's important to separate kind of what they were doing with the tiles, which I think does make more sense in specific not historical knowledge of the American history of the game and how they were marketing it and promoting it, um, which uh, really tapped into the history of race and racism and, and a feeling of cultural erasure and, and uh, appropriation experienced by many Asian Americans. Um, and so really trying to separate those, which were generally not separated <laughs> the discourse, but I think um, trying to identify, okay, there are multiple things happening here is key to understanding. <laughs> um, and the, so the company in their initial marketing, um, they made serious mistakes that were rooted in a lack of knowledge of um, the Asian American experience. If you can, I mean, we know it's not just one experience, but the quote unquote Asian American experience, which is to say, that feeling um, of uh, conditional inclusion, of inclusion only if you are seen as desirable in one way or another. And that so often um, that kind of engagement has taken the form of, oh, well, here's something that is Chinese. We can make it better. We will improve it. And you see that in the 1920s history of the game very, very explicitly. Um, and so the language of um, we can, you know, quite explicitly, right? We can improve on this. Um, and also um, using language like all the traditional tiles, quote, looked the same. That evokes a very, again, pervasive and ongoing experience. This is not just a historical experience. This is an ongoing experience of feeling um, like uh, all 
Asian people, right, are, are seen as, quote, the same. That's rooted to that Orientalist consumerism I talked about, when you could just mishmash Chinese and Japanese and even Middle Eastern cultures together, and because it's all the East, right? That all looks the right. same. That's that's part of that 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 history that people live with very presently when they are hurt by it. But when people aren't hurt by that history, they aren't aware of it unless they seek out education or unless education is integrated into things like our schools or public events, right? Um, right. So. There was a wounding, right, that happened, and um, the but and then a lot of the outrage was furthered by the feeling of this company is coming out of nowhere, create calling something American mahjong that doesn't exist, and changing the tiles, which we have grown up with and understand as a kind of static or sacrosanct thing. And the reality right. is that piece might actually make more sense when you know, oh, there's actually an American history of the game 100 years um, in this country, and that the, the tiles have um, changed in multiple ways in multiple contexts all over the world, including in the United States. That said, I think one thing that is this is the company is also not the first person to, or the first people to um, totally remove Chinese references or this traditional um, uh, patterns on the tiles. But it's a small number of companies that has done that. And that's all been pretty recent. Sanrio, the Japanese company, actually did that with an earlier set that has just they've just continued. But that um, I think when you enter a realm in which a game is no longer recognizable as the same form of a game um, because it's played differently and now the tiles actually are not recognizable as mahjong tiles. I don't think that's the same as an ethical question. I don't think that's the same as a question about the history of race and racism in the United States, but it is a question of games and um, what and the question of, is that actually still Mahjong then? If it's no longer recognizable, is it still Mahjong? And whether or not that feels threatening to you might have a lot to do with your larger feeling of vulnerability in this society. And that's, I think, something that we really need to listen to and pay attention to. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you really, really set up the whole background and um, I think contextualizing the controversy in the fact that while well, there's been a history of erasure, which is still kind of happening, and the fact that um, there is general, um, maybe the word is ignorance to its history, and whether it's this Chinese history or it's American history, or both, um, that that playing a really big part in this controversy, um, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's so interesting to, to think about these days. And I think for our audience members to, to I mean, you can, you can look this up. Uh, it's, it's, it was all over the news actually back in January. Um, and right. I remember when I was reading about it, I thought, oh my gosh, controversy with Mahjong. I, 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 I had no idea what I was in for. Um, <laughs> basically your research, it's, a lot of it is about that too. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> So we have time for a couple more questions. Um, someone said, I had always heard that the European Jewish immigrants who went to China initially learned Mahjong and brought it with them when they immigrated to the US. And I was told that this was one of the reasons why it was considered a Jewish game. Is this just yeah. a fairy tale? Thank you so much for the question. Um, I think they're specifically, tell, you can tell me if I'm interpreting your question correctly, but I suspect this person is, is especially referring to um, the uh, European refugees who were fleeing the Holocaust and um, uh, China was one of a very, very few countries, right? The US famously turned people away. Many countries closed their borders. Um, China was not a kind of perfect welcoming beacon in this scenario, but they accepted more Jewish refugees than most countries did. And so in Shanghai, there were people playing Mahjong. Yes, they were, because Shanghai was, again, still a center of Mahjong culture, even in the context of um, first the 1930s and then also in the context of um, 
keeping in mind that Shanghai was being bombed by the Japanese and that there was war and then civil war, Mahjong continued. <laughs> and Jewish refugees did play it, but they played it in a, in a way that was totally parallel to the ways that um, American and European expatriates were playing it in the 1910s and 20s. It was not at all linked to the American history of the game. So um, I looked hard into this connection and I looked hard into the connection about the possibility of like the Lower East Side and New York residential communities that Chinese and Jewish um, neighborhoods, you know, are, is there cult direct cultural exchange happening in that? But virtually none. That is not where um, uh, Jewish Americans are learning the game. Um, it's certainly not how it becomes associated with Jewish American culture. That is really rooted first in the 1920s, massive national fad, and then in the history of the league. Um, and that is really how people are learning it. Um, and, and again, developing a specific form of the game. So, you know, by, by the time um, I did interview some refugees who had um, survived the Holocaust and they came to the United States and, and learned the game as part of their new communities and um, were also, some of them participated in vacationing communities in the Catskills. So, um, and I'm happy, I see also Jessica shines a um, uh, couple of questions, which I wanna to touch on because it's a great question that is also about uh, something I didn't get to bring up um, in terms of betting and the role of money here. And so she asks, did you write in your book about the Catskills and other women betting? It was normal play. Um, it, it was normal play for money. And I believe the money was used to buy treats for the women. By the way, men played poker similarly to the women playing Mahjong. They had their poker nights. Yes. So um, I'll answer that. I'll comment on the <laughs> that second piece first, which is that Men have lots of leisure patterns that are pretty well established. Poker is especially considered a masculine, uh, um, you know, quote sport. A lot of people, also, of course, we know women do play poker, but it is a strongly masculine in its culture and it's associated with betting. You can, in fact, only play it as a gambling game, as opposed to mahjong, which you can play with without gambling or for um, very small stakes or for very high stakes. Um, and that's part of why it's associated with men is because it's so associated with gambling. But there's not been a lot of cultural pushback at various points if, for example, poker becomes really popular, golf becomes really popular, um, a lot of Jewish men play pinochle. Um, there's not the same kind of chatter about, is this okay? What happens to the home when men are playing poker? Well men just aren't in the home then, right? Or they're, <laughs> um, what happens to the workplace if men are doing these things? Well, if they're doing it after home, we understand that the home is a place of leisure for men, in other words. That is a transition that happened with industrialization after in the, in the mid 1800s. So it's a really long established idea that the home is a place of leisure and that the home is a place of work for women, but we don't call it work. We just call it women's work. <laughs> Um, it's not that it's not considered the same, right? And so um, to have a cultural norm where women were actually exempted from um, putting the kids to bed or taking up space in the home um, that other people were not allowed to go into or eat this special food, that was quite unusual. That was really very unusual. Um, and so I would love to hear if there are other cultural norms that emerge around that. but for it to be such a widespread national norm was very unusual. Um, and they did play for money, but um, it, in general, uh, national or American Mahjong, even in the 1920s, um, as part of this national fad, it was really played for small amounts of money by and large. And so most people will say it's more fun to play with money. The league's game on the card, you see how much different hands are worth. Um, Betting is a part of it, but it's um, it's just as like a part of the game. And a lot of groups play with what's called pie, which is a loss cap. 
And so it means, you know, we play for $5 pie. In the 70s, they played for $2 pie. And it just means you can keep playing even after you've lost your $2. And then when you get your two, you start winning again, then you start paying again, right? But that really creates a, an accessibility to having it stay very low key, very low stakes. Um, not that the games are low key, but that the betting is low key. And that, yes, then they would, not everyone, but many groups did, especially, and still some do play with Kitty, where they pool their money um, and over time save up enough to buy a meal together. And one group I talked to actually um, used the Kitty to pay for a weekend in the Catskills with their husbands. So. <laughs> That's so, that's so, so interesting that, um, you know, the, the, the betting aspect wasn't, it didn't have to be there. I remember when I was a kid, I would watch my grandmother play Mahjong and I would try to learn and she would say, get away from here. This is an adult's game. I don't want you to see me gambling. This is you know very naughty. Don't learn from me. Um, so it's just interesting to see the parallels there too of like, okay, gambling for money. Is this good or bad? Is this taboo? Um, and I think the last oh. question, I, yeah. And I think the last question and I want to- I just, yeah, sorry, go ahead. There's no, more to say ahead. about that, but that's okay. I want to get to the last question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it was just about, uh, someone asked if you played Mahjong, and I know you showed us the very, very first photo, but are you a regular Mahjong player? If folks are yeah, um, you know, I am not a regular Mahjong player, um, and something that I realized over the course of this his research is um, about, you know, <laughs> my own workaholic <laughs> um, lack of uh, um, regular time of just that kind of leisure. I certainly do enjoy visiting with friends. I enjoy visiting with um, people. And oftentimes we're so uh, kind of zonked, we just hang out and talk or we're, you know, eating and drinking. Um, and the game provides a lot of mental stimulation. It's challenging, it's interesting, it's competitive. Um, and I think when I'm less, uh, you know, less work oriented in, in terms of my career, I really can imagine um, wanting that kind of stimulation and that I think Mahjong is a great way to get it. Um, I also admire, like I said, um, you know, laundry workers would play it. Um, this general, I uh, read the memory of um, a man named Frank Ung who grew up in um, uh, above his family's general store in Chinatown. And he would listen to them play it like at three in the morning and they'd have to open the store in, in, at you know bright and early in the morning, but they would still be connecting with people and playing it even when they were exhausted, even when they were busy. Um, and I think that's wonderful. Um, and I do think there will be a time in my life where Mahjong will fill that more regularly. Well, there's always Mahjong Solitaire. If, uh, if, if yeah, not the same, not yeah. the same. <laughs> well, Annalise, thank you again so much for your time and for being with us here all the way from the West Coast. Um, it's been such a pleasure to learn from you. Um, to our audience members, I did send a link where you can purchase the book. Um, it is on the website. I can send it over again in case you didn't get it. But um, you know, we just want to thank you all and hope to see you at the museum when we reopen in June. And Karen, I see your answer question. I didn't get to answer it. Feel free to email me if you want and I can happily respond. So thank you so much again for everyone for being here. All right, take care. Thanks so much, Annalise. Bye. Bye.